I'm only doing, these are the verses I'm doing on the last. Well, good evening. Welcome back to Hardison Baptist Church. Good to have you here with us. Take your hymn books. Turn to 364. 364. When you find your spot, if you can, stand with us as we sing, I will sing of my Redeemer. I will sing of my Redeemer and His one love to me on the cruel cross he suffered from the curse to set me free oh I'll sing of my redeemer with his blood he purchased me on the cross he sealed my pardon paid the debt I will tell the wondrous story How my lost estate to save In His boundless love and mercy He the ransom freely gave Sing of sing of my Redeemer With His blood He purchased me I will praise God my Redeemer and His triumphant power to taste. <laughs> he giveth over sin and death in hell. Sing, oh, sing of my Redeemer. With His blood He purchased me. On the cross he sealed my pardon, paid the debt and made me free. I will sing of my Redeemer and his heavenly love to me. He from death to life hath brought me, Son of God with him to be. Sing, oh, sing of my Redeemer, with His blood He purchased me. On the cross He sealed my pardon, paid the debt and made me free. Well, amen. amen. I know y'all are wondering why are we up here acting like little... 13 year old girls giggling <laughs> and and uh he they just know. told me that the two next songs we're going to sing he's going to sing first second and fourth that this morning i jumped a verse on him i said i am so sorry i, I'm, I feel funny bad when i do that however it's funny sometimes and and then i got there right on that and i didn't realize i did it. i jumped the verse on him <laughs> on that song so uh i just kind of i don't know if y'all can catch on to it but there's a lot yeah. of times that, that um I bomb out pretty bad up here, and then I quiet down and get back in order and just kind of follow my song later, or song later. Okay, well, I appreciate him laughing instead of punching me. <laughs> it's just kind of irony thing, you know. <laughs> um, you know, I, I may push the limits sometimes, but 
if we can't come to God's house and enjoy ourselves and have, mm -hmm. I'm not talking about just make a joke out of everything, but have just have a light spirit and have fun and enjoy ourselves, well, something's wrong. Something's wrong. Yep. We ought to be people of joy and people of happiness. Let's go to the Lord's Word. Brother Scott, how about if you would pray for us tonight, please, sir? Amen. You can be seated. Mm -hmm. um, just really a couple things. Again, I know, I know I mentioned a lot about this morning about the Preacher's Fellowship, but I'm really excited about Tuesday night and all, and I, I hope we have a good turn out of our people, but I appreciate everybody that's been able to be here, and I, I'll just, uh, if I can describe it anyway to you, it'll be probably just like a good revival service, and I'm looking forward to it. We'll be feeding them afterwards, and uh and we're, not, we're not feeding them, we're all eating together. Let me clear that up. Some, you know, we're certainly not going to bring them up here and us sit there and watch them eat. We're going to eat with them. <laughs> but I'm looking forward to that. Uh, Wednesday night, regular service and everything and all. And I, I didn't think about this this morning, that mother, next Sunday is Mother's Day. And with it being Mother's Day, we won't have a PM service. We can, everybody can spend time with families and whoever and uh, just have the evening off. So we'll do that next Sunday. I didn't... Um, I think y'all have been doing that. Me and the deacons talked about that. Mother's Day, Father's Day, Christmas if it falls on a Sunday, and um, Easter. Easter. And we did that Easter. And I, you know, years ago I used to have preached and said any preacher didn't have service on, uh, uh, night service on all those days was liberal and wasn't worth and all this kind of stuff and all that and all. But you know now I've kind of, uh, I used to be really hard on people going on vacation. I realized, you know, you people work hard all year long. They need vacation. They deserve vacation. I do appreciate those, though, that particularly some have had, you know, in the past had different ones that had property out of state and different things that uh, were gone several times through the year. I do appreciate those, though, that find a place to worship when they're going to be away on all. Sometimes you got to be careful of that, though, because every church ain't what their sign says. I found that out the hard way. Go in there, and boy, they get doing some strange things and strange doctrine where they done got off course. Because science said Baptists don't mean they're all right. Anyway, let's move on. We've got a lot on the prayer list, y'all. Just keep, keep in mind those through the week. And, us, and again, Miss Kathy, uh, just, just remember to pray for her. And uh, we've got an unspoken request. Well, praise the Lord. Yesterday, um, well, Austin, our son in law, went to the hospital, has problems. He's had some neck pains the last few days, just like a real strong muscle pain. And uh, they have a problem with that, but then the day before yesterday, I guess it was, I don't know all the details, so I'm not going to try to go into much, but he had some symptoms maybe of heart problems. And he went in and spent a day and a half in the hospital and did a bunch of tests, can't find what's wrong with him, or don't find anything wrong with him, rather. But praise the Lord, he's doing fine, feeling a lot better today, still got neck pain. And in the process of that, their preachers, three of their preacher's daughters were keeping their children at their house. and. The little three-year-old boy, being a boy, tried to climb up on something to get a little something off the wall and fell and bust his head right there and had to go get, so, uh, glue, you don't sew them up no more, you glue them together. Mm -hmm. But glue, no, but it could have been a whole lot worse. But uh, praise God, praise the Lord for that. And uh, anybody else got a word of testimony or not? Anybody? Real quick. Anybody? Good, good. Yes, ma'am. I'm not really good at writing my feelings down, and it takes me a long time to write a note. But I just want to thank everybody for all the love and kindness that has been shown to us, me and my family, and in this difficult time. And it's still not easy. It's been two months today, and it seems like it was just this morning. Amen. Not saying one's better than the other.
sure. It's just different. But uh, I've never been to a Lakers retreat before. Huh? And yesterday was really special for me. Amen. Well, good. Good. But I thank God every day for my salvation. Mm -hmm. And I know that one day I'm going to see it again. As much as I miss him, and I still cry a lot. But it's, I know that I'll see him again. Amen. testimony. Appreciate that. Anybody else? Okay. Well, if not, I'm going to it up and go sit down. Let Brother Bryant lead us in the first, second, second and fourth, fourth verses. Yeah. Both of these songs. Okay. Do you need me to highlight it or? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when I hold up fingers, I don't know what else I could do. Well, from the side, though, I just get, it's all one, you know. I'll just start doing the Van, the Van White <laughs> Wait, thing. there you go, there you go. Yeah. No, no, and honestly, if, right. if y'all's pastor would make it a priority in his <laughs> life to get that 65-inch TV out of my office and put it on that wall right there, I would, well, I could still sing the wrong verse. Right. 141. 141. He hideth my soul. Savior is Jesus my Lord, a wonderful Savior to me. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, where rivers of pleasure I see. shadows a dry thirsty land he hides my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand a wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord, He taketh my burden away. He holdeth me up and I shall not be moved. He giveth me strength in my day. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry thirsty land he hides my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand when clothed in his brightness, transported I rise to meet him in clouds of the sky. His perfect salvation, his wonderful love, how shout it with the millions on high. the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry thirsty land he hides my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand 604. 604, when you find your spot and stand with me as we sing uh, the first, second, and fourth verses of Just Over in the Glory Land. Mm -hmm. 
I've a home prepared where the saints abide just over in the glory land. And I long to be by my Savior's side just over in the glory land. Just over in the glory land I'll join the happy angel band. Over in the glory land, just over in the glory land, there with the mighty host thou stand, over in the glory land. I am on my way to those mansions fair, just over in the glory land, there to sing God's praise and his glory share, just over in the glory land, just over in the glory land, I'll join the happy angel band, just over in the glory land, just over in the glory land, there with the mighty host I'll stand, just over in the glory land. The blood washed strong, I will shout and sing just over in the glory land. Glad hosannas to Christ the Lord and King just over in the glory land. Just over in the glory land, I'll join the happy angel band just over in the glory land. Just over. In the glory land, there with the mighty host of men, over in the glory land. Amen. You can Amen. Be seated. You can be seated. I was uh, one time forgot to sing that. I said something about I don't know how scriptural that song is. I don't know if there's gonna be no band in heaven. And a brother after it said it was gonna be a band of angels worshiping him. So, you know, you don't know a lot of times you take for granted what the songwriter meant, and sometimes we miss that. And uh, they may not mean it the way we take it sometimes. Whoa. Yes, sir. I appreciate that, brother. And the visitors we have, and how people welcome us to you. And I appreciate you and the staff and how much y'all mean to me in my life. Brother, that means a lot. Thank you, brother. Appreciate it. Y'all turn to Hebrews 13. Appreciate it, brother. Oh. Um, Sometimes I feel like a miserable failure. I appreciate, I appreciate that. I was thinking about this earlier. Um, good morning. Good <laughs> evening. That scared me. <laughs> I was thinking about this before we, while we were singing, I think between the third and fourth verse on one of those songs or something, but I was thinking about that there's several people, um, I'm not going to name them because I might forget one of them, that are pretty faithful to watch our services on live stream, and some of them physically aren't able to be here, but there's three sometimes four different people that watch them most Sunday morning services and comment and say something, you know, and I don't know if they're on there now or not and watching, but it, they probably will go back and watch it, maybe. But I don't say how much we appreciate those that watch it live stream that aren't able to be in our services, may live a ways off or not be physically able to be here, whatever the case be, the Lord knows that. 
but we just don't take it lightly. Those that watch by live stream and pre- live stream, live stream, by live stream, we appreciate you that that do watch our services on a regular basis. We appreciate it. Just good to be here. God's been good to us. Um, I don't know about you. I enjoyed the service this morning, and it's good to have the visitors here. It was a good, uh, happy service. Just a good time, and uh, it's good, it good to see fourteen children go through that door and. And they all survived. Fourteen came back through, you know, <laughs> and the workers all survived. But no, I, I, I you know, it's a lot of, a lot of good things going on at Hardison. And I know the church has a rich heritage. There's always been a lot of good things going on. And just like in our individual walks and in the individual churches, sometimes you take dives and you go on, you're on roller coaster rides sometime and all that. But boy, I just uh, long to see what the Lord's going to do here. And um, I believe if, if I'll do my part, and if we'll do our parts, I believe the Lord wants to do a great big old part. You know, Hebrews chapter 13. Um, I'm just going to read verse 5, I mean 15, excuse me, that we preached from this morning and not re- get, go back and read as, quite as much as we did this morning. But the Bible says, By him therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. And um, this morning I started off with talking about what's the best thing you possess or the most special thing you possess, and certainly it's our salvation. And, and after all that Christ did for us, how we ought to be willing to sacrifice some things in our life for, for him. And um, so let's, let's go ahead and just pray. Father, I thank you for the sweet spirit here tonight. And uh, Lord, I thank you for those that might be watching via live stream. God, I just pray that you do a great work in our midst tonight. Help us, Lord, to be encouraged. God, help me to preach what's necessary and needful and strike from my mind, Lord, and uh, things that wouldn't be helpful to us. God, help us tonight. Be with all those. I know we got several traveling in different places tonight. Be with them. Lord, might be some that just simply chose not to come tonight. I pray that you'd work in their hearts. God, help us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Chris from a little amen corner down there. All right, let's uh, continue on. Or, or, well, not continue on. Before we continue on, we're going to review back. And I, and I owe you an apology. I realized that I remember doing it this morning. But the first thing we looked at this morning, the first point in this thought was the, the continual sacrifice that we need to be, that we ought as Christians, that we really owe to the Lord. And we, don't, we don't pay back for our salvation, but we're saved unto good works. And we read that over in Ephesians 8 9. Uh, the, uh, 2, 8, 9 this morning and talked about that a little bit. But the first thing was in verse five, verse 6 where it says, so that we may boldly say the Lord. And I, I stopped on that right there before it goes on. The Lord and just, we ought to say with our lips, we ought to just praise the Lord for who he is. I mean, just that he's an almighty, gracious, and loving God. That it's just his attributes and who he is and how amazing he is. And, and then we moved on and, and I, I told you, um, verse 5, continued sacrifice of giving thanks to a name. And I remember going down and reading it. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And I, and I said, and I went on and preached the points of, of uh, continuously, the continual sacrifice of giving thanks to his name. And that verse doesn't say that. So I remember trying to kind of cover that a little bit and talk about because of his presence we're thankful for him but I knew that and and I forgot it's verse 15 and the night I went back and I was going over that and I said I know that I, I remember kind of looking down you ever done that brother Bryant look at the wrong verse and then try to apply it and it don't apply so you just wrote you never made that mistake <laughs> I had never seen the wrong verse either <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, and maybe you haven't. Now, maybe I'm just goofy that way, but I do it every now and then. But verse 15, now this point will make a lot more sense now. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Okay, there's that giving thanks to his name that I was referring to. And that's thanking him. Get the, 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 in verse 6, it says, boldly say, the Lord is my helper. When we boldly say, that's, that's praising him. When we boldly say, the Lord is my helper, the Lord. 
But then giving thanks, if we're giving thanks, we're giving thanks for the things that he does for us. And I'm talking about saving us, for loving us, for being merciful, for daily renewed mercy, and just all the things that God does for us. And, and uh, you know, and I, I really don't think that in a day, I, I, know, I, know, I believe two things, in a day I don't even think we realize in our human minds how much he's doing for us through that day. And if in, in a tenfold times that, I believe we don't praise him enough for what he does for in a day. Now, I, I try when I'm preaching to say we, unless it's a very specific sin or something, I try to say we don't do what we ought to do. And we don't because I'm preaching to myself up here. I'm human just like you. And sometimes, man, God pours the honey all over you and you just eat the honey. I, and by the way, I love honey. But you uh, eat honey and eat the honey and just go on and bite it. And you done three or four meals later before you think about, you know, I show us some good honey. Thank you, Lord. And I think we do that in, a lot, in our lives a lot of the times, don't we? But continuing on, verse 20 and 21, I read these for you this morning. And talking about how, how much he sacrificed for us that we looked at the physical, the physical thing of the Lord's Supper as a picture of the spiritual, the physical thing that he did for us in a spiritual picture, I guess we could say. But verse 20 and 21, the Bible says, Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. And it says, Make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. There is so much truth in that verse. You know, we talk about, we get the idea sometimes we say, well, so-and-so, and, and when I say this, I say it with respect. We may go say, oh, so-and-so, man, they, they're a powerful service. Man, that's a great Sunday school teacher. Or that's a, a great uh, missionary or whatever. But the truth of the fact is, is really they're not great. And, and they're, anything we do is not our greatness. The things that are great for the Lord are things where we get out of the way that he does those things through us. It's when we're yielded to him. And if you go back and read that verse uh, in 21, let's see if it's in, let me say, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. And there, there's several more verses. I, there's one particular one I can't think right off the top of my head right now that's got to do with that same subject there of, of letting him work in us and through us through, through, for his will be done. Because, boy, um, we do what we would do, and in our best efforts, but we'd fall very short of the glory of God, fall short of being pleasing to the Father, but when we allow him to work through us. But my third point there is personal sanctification. Honor him the sacrifice, continual sacrifice of personal sanctification. Uh, let's turn over in Hebrews, put your... Ribbon there. Miss Betty, you can put your switchblade there. <laughs> Got to pick on Miss Betty a little bit. Go to Romans 12. Hmm. I, don't, I don't even know if I said Romans 12 yet, did I? But Romans 12. Romans 12, 1, and I know this is a very familiar passage to you. But boy, it ought not ever get old to us. We might get tired of reading it because we get tired of all the bent out of shape it shows that we are a lot of times as Christians. It says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice you know, living sacrifice, that's kind of like continual sacrifice and, and, and continual. And that's, that's a, think about how strange a word that was to them, thinking of a sacrifice has always had to do with death. But he's putting in the wording of sacrifice, a living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And I have a hard time reading through that passage. I know you can get some 
books and you'll run across some stadium, some th things and I'm not going to say this guy's name that I want to say it's on TV and he smiles a lot because I've never heard him preach on this passage but people of that like that twist up the word of God to make it just all positive little pat on the back for everybody would say things like that and say things like this that he has three wheels that depend on how good you walk and with which wheel you're in if you're in a, um, a, a good wheel or as acceptable wheel or as perfect wheel that is hogwash God has one will that is good, perfect, and acceptable. We're either in his will or we're out of his will. We're either pleasing to him or not pleasing to him. And, I, and, I, and I'm not talking about sinless perfection. Don't, don't misunderstand what I'm trying to say here. But we should never get to the point that we accept, well, I do this right, like checking boxes. I think you mentioned that this morning, brother. And I, like, well, I'll, I'll do this, I'll pick this, I'll pick that. And every Christian I know and I'm one of every Christian I know, by the way, is guilty of that to some extent. And, and I'm not going to say that's okay, because that would be like I'm insinuating that it's okay to be kind of in one of those good, acceptable, to be kind of like backtracking on what I just said. But when we do that expense of others, and I think the problem lies when, when we get uh, uh, everybody else, uh, when we talk about the subject of being not like the world, when we look down on others that we've surpassed what they've gathered in our opinion and we think we're somebody because we've done a few areas but checked a little few more boxes or different boxes than they have. I think there's a lot of problems in that in Christianity. And, um, but I just, but being not transformed to this world, we all just desire to be pleasing with the Lord and there's a, a conscious and a dealing with the heart. Now there's some things that are scriptural principles. The Bible says, thou shall not. And then he talks about certain specific things. And, and even within those, some of those, we don't know the exact limits of, you know, uh, a certain area. I'm, I'm thinking one I don't want to say right now, but there's certain things we make that are kind of gray areas in the scripture. Well, let's get into a whole nother message here, but then there's doubtful disputations and things that we ought to discard ourselves. But it all goes back to the conscious and being of a, of a sad, doing those things of faith. And the book talks about what is ever, whatsoever is not done of faith is sin. And meaning of faith that you've got a clean, and clean heart and all. And I know uh, a newborn Christian just got saved, doesn't know really anything about the Bible, could do some things that are pretty hard sin and may not, he might could say, well, that, I've got a good conscience about it because I didn't know the Bible doesn't say that. That's, that's not what I'm talking about. That's kind of foolishness and a foolish thought there. But uh, most time, I think when we're crossing lines, we've got a pretty good idea we're crossing lines. And I think we ought to just be willing to please the Lord and desire, desire to please the Lord. Um, but the, but the, that you present your body as a living sacrifice. And then it goes on, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. You realize when we've done that, when we've lived a day tr pleasing the Lord, trying to please the Lord, trying to walk in his footsteps, trying to model our life after him, you realize that's not a, super, a superstar Christian. That's not a hero Christian. That's just our reasonable service. That's just what's expected of us. Um, let's move on. I'll just read this verse, Romans 6, 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? So there's clear pictures in Scripture that we ought to avoid sin as much as we can. As, we ought to, as much as we know of the Bible and hiding the word in our heart, we might not sin against God. We ought to have a desire to be pleasing Him in our life and not live sinful lives and things that we know are sinful. And we live in a society where there's a lot of things that are just accepted now because they're socially accepted. Socially accepted don't mean that God's pleased with it. And, and anymore, I mean, it's, it's sad some of the things that are just never spoken against in churches anymore because so many people partake of them. I'm, I'm, let me just use this. There's two or three other things in my heart that I want to say, but let me just use this, the idea of social drinking. I believe the scriptures clearly teach that, I mean, wine is a mocker. And, and drunkards, all the things when it's changed color in the glass, they're fermented wine, they're fermented drink, and all that. I just don't, I don't think we're, it has a place in a Christian's life. Uh, 
and, and I'm not talking about, and I, I'm not saying this is okay or whatever. There might be somebody that has a particular condition. They might drink a little something. There's a person passed about wine for the stomach. I know that's taken out of context to say to drink that anytime you see it, go get you a bottle of liquor or whatever. I'm not saying that's what that means because that has a specific meaning in its culture and in its time that had to do with the, the, the filthiness of the food they ate. They didn't have the processes we have now. But I'm just saying in general, for general Christians have no business drinking alcohol and fooling with it and partaking of it. It's a mocker. But in certain Christian circles anymore, it's just a normal everyday thing. Uh, man, some of the, uh, well, I'm debating to say this or not, but some Christians I know, a family of Christians I know that at one time were so hard-lined against just any sin you could name, man. I mean, anything you did, something had to be wrong with it and forced it down your throat. And any time I see any picture of that whole family on, on social media at Thanksgiving, at Christmas, where they're all standing around with beer in their hand, I thought, what made you think that's okay? Or do you think it's all right? But the problem is, is a lot of folks just act like it's all right. And, and man, in, in certain churches, they're not going to preach against that. They're not going to preach what I just said because they might lose $4,000 worth of tithe. I'm going to tell you what, I, I personally don't care. If the Bible calls out a sin, I don't care if you tithe $5,000 a month. I'm going to preach what God lays on my heart. I'm not going to back up pronouncing sin to pat anybody on the back. Now, that don't mean I want to attack you with the Bible. I hope not to anyway. I ought not to. But I found that that's not productive preaching when you do that. And aggravate somebody and just reel, reel them in on that sin. Y'all not call the pastor out for singing the wrong verse. Don't you see that in Proverbs over there? Don't you see that? I think we could just all agree that we know the Lord desires us to walk with him, to walk in his will, to be in his perfect will, to model our lives after him. Things that we know are sin, try to avoid them. Turn to him for strength. We all have besetting sins. We all have weaknesses and, and, and such as that. I understand that. But because something's a besetting sin does not mean it's okay with God's sin. So just because we struggle with something, I'm just trying to say that's more reason. Just, just ask the Lord to help you, to help us with that. But we ought to, uh, oh, by the way, the, the first point was worship him and say things good about him because, of, because he's God. The second point was to um, thank him for all that he does, a continual sacrifice of praise and thanking him. And then the other one was for personal sanctification, to honor him by being like him. I, I think of this, I, I don't know if I've ever said this before. Um, hopefully they'll come to the preacher's fellowship, even though uh, the, family, the, the daddy of the family is not a preacher. They go to a lot of the meetings there. It's a family that was in the first church I pastored, and they've not been here yet, but at some point in a revival or something, they'll come here, y'all will meet them. And it's a, a dear friend, family friend of ours named um, the May family, Mark and Sandra May, and Clay and Tiffany is their children, their adult children. And Clay's got Down syndrome. Awesome. I love Bobo. We call him Bobo. They try to call him Clay now, but growing up, he was Bobo. And, um, and, and when, I moved, when we moved to Eastman, Brother Clay was about, I, I say Brother Clay, if you ever meet him, you'll, you'll see this. I say, oh, Brother, Brother Clay, and he'll say, oh, Brother Jim. But, huh? Brother Lane, oh, Brother Lane, that's right, oh, Brother Lane. But he was, I guess, 17 or 18, now, and he's, I don't know, well on his 30s now and all. But, but when I was, you know, at 17, I, I would say, you know, he was uh, in some ways, a little younger than the actual 17, if you know what I mean. And, and in Sunday school, one of the older men took the senior men in the sanctuary, and I took the teenager boys and the 21, 22-year-olds. It wasn't but 17 of us all together, so we split it up kind of weird. And one lady took the ladies in back, I think, if I remember right, and, and all. But Clay would sit beside me. And I remember sometimes reading uh, scriptures and, uh, and, and, then, and teaching in Sunday school, and sometimes he was sitting there and put his hand on mine, just rub mine when I preached, I mean when I talked and taught, that's what I'm trying to say. And, uh, but, but where I was going with that is if I wore a brown suit to church that morning, that night, a lot of nights, he would show up with clothes that matched what I had on that morning because he wanted to be like his preacher. I can't tell you how much that meant to me. 
He's, Clay, I don't know if you'll say this, buddy, but I love you, buddy. He's awesome. And I hope y'all get to meet him one day. He's awesome. I, I know y'all probably don't know who Sammy Allen is. It ran the camp meeting at Resaca, Georgia for a lot of years. I don't know, tell them how many preachers are preaching the gospel all over the world now, missionaries all over the place, all over this country that came out of his church, that grew up under his ministry. But Brother Sammy Allen had a huge effect on a lot of people. But that camp meeting, and all the people in Eastman went to that camp meeting every year for years, and Clay grew up going to it. And old Brother Sammy Allen's got a few little motions that he's known for. One of them was like one, hey, man, brother. He'd do his hand like that, say, amen. And old Brother Clay, he'll do that. He'll say, hey, man, preacher, hey, man, like that. And so I'll say, hey, man, hey. And what I'm trying to say, he tries to model who he loves. And I don't deserve anybody to model me, but it sure honors me the fact that a, that a young man like that would, would want to be like his preacher puts a lot of responsibility on but my point is this not that I'm worthy of any of that or any preacher is but 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 our our duty ought to be to want to be like our master ought to be like him and he walked without sin and boy it ought to be our desire and he talked about pleasing the father and the father's will him and the father are one think about what Jesus said particularly in the book of John the things he said and, and yet in in perf- perfect deity with the father equal to total part of the trinity i don't know how to say it any any other way but if he spoke often of being pleasing to the father and doing the father's will and he bore our sin on calvary shouldn't we be willing to make a continual sacrifice of personal sanctification making change in our life to be pleasing to the father (coughs) excuse me Verse 16. Oh, we better, better, better go back to Hebrews. Let me read 15 with 16, kind of keep it flowing. But him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. What is it called a sacrifice of praise? When something sacrificed, what does it do? That's a trick question. That's one of those that nobody wants, everybody knows the answer, but nobody wants to answer because you wonder what, what angle I'm hitting that from. What I'm saying sacrifice has to do with dying and pray to praise the Lord. Flesh don't want to. Pride don't want to. And to praise the Lord is a, is a sacrifice. The sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Look at verse 16. But to do good, I'm going to stop there. It flows together, but to do good and to communicate, forget not. But I'm going to stop there. It says, but to do good. Well, just doing good. Uh, I believe we could put that on the heading of personal sanctification, not personal sanctification, but continual sacrifice. To just do good. And look at Hebrews in our text chapter. Look at verses 1 and 2. Let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember then them that are in bonds as bound with them. Wow. And them which suffer adversity as being yourself in the body. Also in the body. I mean, you know, there's a whole saying, if we walk a mile, you know, some, some particular person, we can criticize them, but, you know, they'll say, if we walk a mile in their shoes, you might understand them more. And what I believe we can see from that when people are in tough times and things going on and all that, if we just get in there and walk a mile in their shoes with them, we probably could help them a lot more than we could just stand on the outside and say, well, look at so and so. Why do they do that? Why are they always like that? Well, we don't always know. I'm not excusing sin. Now, don't misunderstand me. But, man, there's a lot of folks going on, things going on in folks' lives, and, and you just don't ever know. And sometimes you know the whole story. They call it the back story. You know, the back story thing sometimes makes you understand things a little different sometimes. <laughs> to do good. Romans 12 21. Oh, but by the way, in Hebrews 13, 1 and 2, there's a little pattern of just doing good. Let brotherly love continue. That's a good thing, isn't it? Be not forgetful to entertain strangers. 
that don't mean when a stranger walks out to get a get guitar, I sang Oh Susanna and went to Alabama, you know, that don't mean that kind of entertaining. Holding the door for folks, whatever might be the case, you don't have to know somebody to help them along the way. There's a lot of videos out, out today. Me and my wife watched one this afternoon. It was, uh, man, well, and I've seen a lot of these videos lately, and I've not experienced this yet in life. But like the one we watched today was a man walked up with a person at a gas station with a gas can. And uh, like one of the, while the pump gas said, could you give me some gas? And there's like, no, get away. I don't, I don't you know. And, and uh, they said, well, my car's down, broke down the road. I, I don't care. That's not my problem. And, and two or three of the problem, two of the people, three of the people told them, well, I, I work hard my money. I'm not giving you my gas and all that. And I'm not saying those folks necessarily wrong for that because there's bum, bums and beggars all over the place. But they had a gas can. They weren't saying give me money. They had a gas can. And then when finally somebody said, oh, sure, and, and pulled out. Personally, I would have just pulled it over and squirted a gallon of gas in there. Well, I mean, I think I would if I felt led. I'm just, but I'm saying, rather than this person pull out the billfold and gave them a little bit of money. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying they were wrong for doing that. My point is, when they did that, that person pulled out like several bills and handed it to them. So it's kind of a setup to see who would help. Do you follow me? And to see who would help. And then somebody else walked up and said, here, let me give them another stack that was with them, maybe part of the camera crew. So it was a planned thing. And I've seen several things where people would go up to people in grocery stores and ask them a question or two or ask to borrow a dollar or something like that. And then they would turn around and give them, and they would show 500 or or $1,000. Now, whether it's planned and they're really not doing this all fake and this feminine, I don't know. But, but from now on, if anybody walks up to me at a gas can at a gas station, I'm going to definitely squirt a gallon of gas in their can. <laughs> I'm just trying to say sometimes we'll just do good, entertain angels, angels, angels too, maybe. Angels, uh, strangers, better yet. It says, be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. You say, believe that? You really believe that? You think, yeah, I do. I don't know. I've seen a lot of things I can't explain, and the longer I live, there's more I can't explain. But I know God's amazing enough. God... I don't put a limit on what he can do. Now, he's not going to violate scripture, I can tell you that. But I've just heard cases of people that were credible, things that I can't explain. But I think uh, any time somebody needs a hand of kindness, I'm not saying give anybody $50, come to the team and ask $50. Don't take me wrong, be wise. But I'm just saying we ought to consider and Seek the Lord's advice real in a quick sense and kind of be more willing to help others. Not necessarily always in the giving of money. That seems to be because there's so many liars standing around with signs that say, well, work for food. No, you didn't. If you would, you would. You wouldn't be drawing signs and standing there with your car parked over behind the bushes. But doing good. What's the saying? Evil prevails when good, do, good men do nothing. And doing good isn't always charity. Doing good sometimes has got to do with voting right and voting scriptural, as scriptural as you can anyway. It's got to do with a lot of aspects of our life doing good. Um, so doing good. And it goes on and says, do good. Wait a minute. In verse 16, I lost my place. I looked down at the bottom of the wrong page. It says, but to do good and to con communicate, forget not. Okay, it's not talking about pick up a walkie-talkie and say something to them, communicate. It's talking about giving and helping with the need. Now, that does tie back together the way I focused that on doing good, but it says communicating and that communicating but do good and co to communicate, forget not. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Certainly given in the case of charity, given to folks that's just in a need, certainly would, I believe, qualify to meet that. But I believe missions given and such as that is, is more the aim of that. And you, you hear the 
you see that a few times in the book of Acts. You see it in the Pauline epistles where he talks about the churches of Macedonia communicating with them. And it's talking about they sent money that was to help them, whether it be money or eggs or, or chickens or whatever it be. It was something that would help them to continue to preach the word and continue the furtherance of the gospel. So do good. God's, uh, God's well pleased when we do good. That's a, and the flesh don't want to do good. The flesh a lot of time wants to do opposite. Now, if there's an audience, flesh loves to do good. But just do good to do right. You know, like Bob Jones Sr., do right till the stars fall. If everybody's doing wrong, do right. And there's more to that saying, but I can't remember all the quote. But basically, it's do right till the stars fall. falls. probably the biggest thing that he was known for as far as a as far as a quote, that is. But uh, do good. And God's well pleased with that. Um, the, let, me, let me read to you what I was speaking of, the sacrifice of communicating. Why is it a sacrifice? Well, because well, sometimes folks love that money, don't they? And we know what the Bible says about that. Not the money, but the love for it. Sometimes we're I'm just saying to communicate when we give to missions, when we give to causes the Lord leads us to. And by the way, I believe in local church giving. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think it's scriptural for Christians to send money to a TV evangelist. If your local church decides to take that on as a mission, it's worthy of a mission, give through the local church. I believe God honors local New Testament. That's Bible, by the way. They came and gave to the storehouse. He didn't say go to every TV preacher and send money to this, that. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong to send it to a certain charity, uh, you know, if you send whatever. But I'm a little leery of these people that die and leave a million dollars. A Christian die and leave a million dollars to Humane Society or something like that. And missionaries all over the world trying to get the word out, trying to print Bibles and all that, you know. So Christians, be wise in your charities that you choose. That's not part of the passage here it even has a little bit of my opinion in it, but I think it's a Bible-backed opinion or a Bible-thinking opinion. Sacrifice. Oh, Philippians 4, verses 14 through 18. Notwithstanding, ye have done well done that you did communicate with my affliction. Now, ye Philippians, know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica you sent once and again unto my necessity, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. Boy, does that not fall right into what I said, uh, sacrifices of of continual sacrifice, that sacrifice acceptable, and the communicating. Uh, so the sacrifice, sacrifice of communicating. Verse 18 says, pray for us that we trust. Wait a minute, let me get where I can read that. Pray for us, for we trust we have a good conscience and all things willing to live honestly. Now there's a whole lot more said than what I'm going to say about it. I just want to focus on with the subject of the message tonight, continual sacrifice, and it says pray for us. Just a quick note on that. It's a sacrifice to pray. Flesh don't want to. I don't know about yours, but mine seems to want to fall asleep when I try to pray. You know, anybody else here suffer that? Lay down at night and try to, try to pray. Now, but this is weird. You try to pray, sincerely to pray, and, and you fall right asleep. But if you can't sleep and you're laying there wide awake and think, well, I'll pray so I fall asleep, you're going to be wide awake. You're probably fitting to pray or the biggest prayer you ever prayed. Maybe it's because of praying for the wrong motive. I don't know. Am I the only one that's ever experienced that? Yeah. Sacrifice of prayer. The sacrifice, Proverbs 15, 8, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination of the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. I'll, I'll close. I've got a couple of other ones. They're a little bit different areas and kind of separate messages. So I'll, I'll leave it with that. Um, let, me, let me just hint at one. Uh, 
I was looking for a particular verse over here, but in, in verse 17, it says, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they must, uh, must give account, that they do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Um, I'm cautious of a pastor that every time he preaches, he preaches about his pastoral authority and, and obeying the preacher and doing everything to preach. I'm, I'm cautious of a guy like that because a lot of times they're on an ego trip and they're about building their kingdom. But, it, but while we're there and I'm in this text, I do want to say that that is a scriptural thought. In the Bible, the, the pastor is the under-shepherd. Now, I'm not saying everything I say you better go do I, I just say if I'm preaching the Word of God, you, you, it'd do you good to do what the Bible says while I'm preaching biblically to follow the Bible. But as far as following every opinion I have, oh, wow, you'd be twisted up as I am if you did that. <laughs> there, there, but, but as far as leadership, and if I say that I believe the Lord's leading to do this, and, and I'm a little leery when people even say that, but, but there's a, there's a, that obey doesn't mean like, yes, sir, jump in if the pastor says go run out in front of a car or whatever. That's not what it's talking about. And nor would a pastor that takes that about not lording over God's heritage try to treat people that way. So there's a balance there. But I, I brought this up. My, I, I wrote it this way. The point I had written is sacrifice of submission. Here at Hardison, I've not sensed a lot of that. The The... Well, I'm trying not to sound like I'm putting myself as a pastor or, any, or a pastor on a, on a pedestal. I'm trying to say that scripturally the pastor is the under-shepherd of the church. It's not the deacons aren't that, the Sunday school teachers, the song leaders. I just saw I'm picking on you so much tonight. But whatever title a person has, there's, there's not, none of those are positions of authority in the Bible. There's not a verse that even hints at that. Now, however, I appreciate our deacons and our advice when we get together and our counsel in doing that, but that's not even a deacon's job. But it is a good thing for the deacons because they're mature men that we sit down and discuss business things and, and th what might be the best and get input from all sides and things like that. But the deacons aren't the authority of the church. And I'm not saying that to the little deacons. I'm just trying to say that. And, well, and the reason I'm, I'm saying that, that this church seems to understand that. In the average church in America, particularly in certain big denominations, uh, they're deacon run. The deacons make all the decisions. The pastor just got to hire and fire and get rid of. If he really, I mean, and, some, and I'm not saying every preacher's been there a long time is a bad preacher by all means. But, but if they like him and all that, sometimes they got a good chance of staying there in a church of that matter. But boy, once they cross two or three of those powers, self-appointed powers, they're out the door. They'll run them down the road. It goes on every day. And the people of the church, I, I've heard people say, well, let's go talk to Deacon. said something not right. Well, let's go talk to Deacon and see if they'll do this. Well, why don't you go to the Bible and see what the Bible says about that? Now, I said it's hard to preach that in your own pulpit because it sounds like you're saying, y'all listen to me, I'm the boss. I, I, don't, I hope I never come across as having that attitude. The, the reason I do feel I need, need to go back and hit, touch that a minute is because it's, it's not for those that aren't any problem. It's for those that are a problem. That, that, that one of their job, uh, and, and I've had people in the past that you could tell from the first day they visited church, they came to straighten you out, buddy. And they'll, and they'll be there for a long time, and boy, they just think their job is to straighten you out. It says, obey then, have the rule over you, and submit yourselves. That's submission. That's not foolish, and it's not, it's, it's, it's kind of like the husband, the head over the wife. Now, some women, boy, you say something, you can read that out of the Bible, and man, they're going to just start jumping around their seat because they're not fixing to obey nothing any man says because they're unbiblical women. But it might be because they got a husband that's as mean as a snake that doesn't deserve her, her love. And he tries to, he thinks being the head of the household means sit on his rear end, not do nothing and drive her like a slave. And that ain't what the Bible's talking about either. 
Boy, if he loves her and protects her and takes care of her and, and treats her like a great wife and puts her in that place that she ought to be as a bride, she'll respect him. She won't have a problem when he says, honey, I don't think we need to do this or I think we ought to. And, and by the way, I think even in, in the right order in the household, they ought to counsel together about those things a lot of times and all. I appreciate my wife. She'll tell me her opinion. She'll tell me that and all that, but it's said and done. She's still telling me her opinion. <laughs> uh, there, there's things that she knows is my decision to make. But most every decision we make is together. I would hope to be a pastor like that, to make decisions with that. However, everything the Lord leads me to do probably is not going to please everybody. But there's always some, and look, look, look at the verse again. I mean, I want to go on and continue on. It says, for they that watch your souls, as they might, must give account. Oh, say in the direction of the church and the, the direction it aims or heads or falls, whatever. Sure, individually would all, if somebody did something that caused the church problems, sure, they'll answer to God for it. But the bottom line is, is the pastor is the one that's going to give an account. I had a deacon standing up for heresy one time tell me that uh, when I said something about, well, I give an account. He said, we're all going to give an account. I thought, well, there's your problem right there. And I think that was the last meeting I ever had with those fellows before I resigned their church. He said, they may give it, must give account that, that they may do it with joy. Listen to that. See, when that relationship is right, it's a joyful experience that we're not grieved. And it says, and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. So if a person's that one that's always got a buck, the God-given authority, and please understand, I mean, I know I've said this over and over again, I'm not talking about a pastor that's just iron fist ruling, and you do this, you do that, and they're out there, I promise you. I try not to be that way, but there are times when I have to say, this is what I feel like we need to do. But for those that have always got to put a little edge wise, always got to always got to throw in a little something and say, "Well, I don't really think that's what we need to do," and I always got to bring it up, or uh, man, I just got to just say a little something under the breath all the time and all that. The Bible says that is unprofitable for you. But it's I'm going to take that out of the context of the, that it's in right there. Even at work, if you've got a boss. And I say that, and I think everybody, just about it, most everybody here is retired. <laughs> but, but somebody, if you've got a, a boss you work for, and you always barely can that boss your authority? And, and somewhere or the other, he's the authority that God's put in your life, the, the governor, whoever. But there, there, the authorities, there's no authority that God hadn't allowed and set in order to be. But if you've got a boss, and we're always bucking that authority of our boss and always undermining them and, and tearing down everything they say and all that, it's not going to be good for you. Why do we think it different in the kingdom of God? I'm preaching to the choir. I mean, I really, really am. There's not a soul here tonight that's ever gave me one second grief over any decision I made that I remember. I mean, except for maybe her. But, <laughs> but I say that. I know one of our deacons here tonight, Brother Bryant's never. He's gave me encouraging advice. He's tried to maybe guide me in a way that he thought might help be advice to help me. Not like, but he's never, he's never snooted his nose up and said, well, we ain't going to do that. That ain't the way we do it at Hardison. I didn't mean to spend that long a time on that. I really say it as a praise and thank you for being so easy to work with. And, but I think I've all, I hope I've come across as one that's not always tried to do everything opposite of what you would want done or whatever, but ultimately it's what the Lord wants done. But I believe if it's the Lord's will, it's probably not going to be against everybody here, right? You follow what I'm saying? So there is a sacrifice of submission. L ladies in the home, that would apply. And men in the home, because our head is God, right? And the head, is, the head of the man is Jesus, and the head of the wife is the husband. Isn't that Bible? So men, we've got to sacrifice at home too. A lot more could be said about that because in those subjects of authority, given Bible given authority, uh, um, I think there's a ebb and flow. There's not a, 
iron fist and rule and all that authority. Except for when out of bad spirits is confronted and uh, then I think it becomes more, I mean, I, I use Moses' example. Look at how Moses led and all that and, and he was gracious with people. He worked, uh, I, I'm just trying to think when people really came against him, the things that were clearly God's will and people came against him, it just didn't work out good for them. But most everything he did was in their favor that they accepted as their favor that they were going on. There was food and such as that, but some had to complain, sit over in the corner, complain about it. And I'll mention another one, just me, I just mentioned it. Another one, and it's not really in this passage, but a sacrifice of a heart broken over sin. And uh, it's sad, I, I want to say in America, it might be this way in every country, but I live in America, so I'm going to say in America, that we're entertained by so much sin. And so many things that are sin people laugh at. I, I see videos that people put out there, and it'll be like a small child, a three or four year old child talking filthy. I mean, like a sailor. And the comments on it will be all like cute and funny. That's so cute. There ain't a thing cute about that. Not one thing cute about that. Or, you know, just things that, that are. I don't know. This whole world just ain't my home. And we get, it's too easy to get used to things of this old world because we live in it. We ain't got no choice. But God's going to pull us out of here one day. But sacrifice of a heart broken over sin. Psalm 51 verse 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, wilt thou not despise? Well, we ought to be saddened by sin rather than so often laugh at it. That's challenging because the world we live in, I mean, everywhere, every, you know, I read a thing today, uh, I don't remember the actor's name, and it's a movie, I don't care, I don't care nothing about all them superhero movies. I'm not saying that you ought not to I just I didn't care for comic books except for the last few pages where you could buy a horn for your bicycle or whatever. But the comic books to me were just stupid. I ain't, it didn't make no sense to me. I didn't like them. And I don't care much for the superhero movies. Uh, but if some actor just playing a lead role in one of them that's real big right now, I don't know what it was. I don't know his name. But he's professed his faith in Christ openly several times. And it's costing him dearly. And because he went to a church that apparently the preacher preached something like I preach every now and then and pronounced a certain popular sin of this day, this, you know, LGBTQPF, MW, whatever their names are, and all that. He, they, I don't know what the church did, but he's declared that he attended a church that, that is anti-LGBTQ or whatever it is. So they're trying to ban him in Hollywood and get him to re-roll that and all that stuff. And he, he came out with a statement. He said, I, you're totally wrong. I go to a church that welcomes everybody. He didn't say they acknowledge everybody's sin and love their sin. But that's the world we live in. Why would they accept Jesus? Well, I went all over the place tonight. I hope some of his has been a continually sacrifice, sacrificing continually. No saying it's going to cost you something to live for Jesus. It does. Got to die to self. A lot of times our, our own little will, that little thing we want to do sometimes, sometimes has to be put on the back burner to do what God wants us to do. And that would apply in the don't do's as well. You know what I mean by that. Well, been all over the place on that tonight. Looking back through it, though, real quick, continue to sacrifice of praising God. For just for who he is, just with our lips, saying how good a God he is. Continue to sacrifice of giving thanks to his name for those things he does. Continue to sac sacrifice of just being obedient, uh, trying, to, trying to live in the steps of our Savior. Because flesh wants to take a step of that world. We need to let the Lord have us take steps in the footsteps of Jesus. Sacrifice of just doing good. Flesh would rather not. But we as children of God all desire to. Continue sacrifice of communicating, of giving, 
certainly in missions and, and, and your tithes and offerings, that's not even really part of that. But, but, but in that, that kind, we should be faithful in that too. But not only that, but just the, all, the kind of communicating, whatever it be through that or, or helping someone in need, whatever it might be, the person at the gas station, be wise in that. Seek the Lord's counsel always. Uh, be careful with that. Prayer, sacrifice, flesh don't like it. I said that a while ago, almost feeling a little guilty saying that about falling asleep now, but now I think about some of God's choice servants did that in Garden of Gethsemane, didn't they? Sacrifice of submission. Always wanting to buck the authorities that God's put in place. Appreciate y'all being faithful church and not having an attitude like that. And then sacrifice of a broken heart over sin. Probably a lot more sacrifice we ought to make. Above all, do you know Jesus Christ Savior? You know that you know that you know. If you died right now, you go to heaven. Maybe something 10,000 miles from anything I've said tonight might be troubling your heart tonight. Not going to have a song or anything, but if there's anything you need to come pray about, this altar is always open. And um, we'll just take a second. If anybody comes to the altar, we'll, we'll wait. Give you time to pray. If you don't, you don't need to, Nobody comes forward. Brother Bryant, how about if you'll dismiss us in, in just a minute when you feel led to, please.